In her book, The Crucified God in the Carolingian Era, Theology and Art of Christ's Passion, Celia Chazelle studies plastic images of the Passion of Christ produced during the final centuries of the first millennium. On the basis of an educated art criticism, she discovers that works of art are not to be considered as simple translations of or parallels to theological statements, but instead could take on rules of their own through the appropriation of iconographic traditions. For example, the author points to a miniature of the crucifixion found in the well-known sacramentary of Jalon, which depiction of Christ on his cross aims to instruct clearly that the one crucified possesses both divine and human natures. I say the well-known uh, sacramentary of uh, Jalon. It's well known to those who study ancient sacramentaries. Actually, it's one of the earliest, don't, so don't feel bad. Um, it's uh, a sacramentary, which is what we have today, the, the prayer book for the Mass that the priest uses, that dates to the 8th century, so it's written for some time around 790, so it's a very early example both of illuminated manuscript, but also of the ritual prayers of the Mass, and this is of the Gelasian type, which uh, in fact uh, dates even earlier, originating in Spain, arguably under Pope Gelasius. In any event, on, in this little miniature, of which I was an, unable to provide a, a copy for you, there are what she, the author is calling iconographic traditions that clearly point out, no one, that Christ on the cross is both God and man, so that the uneducated or uncatechized wouldn't make the mistake or not get the full message of what a crucifixion is. Chazelle goes on to conclude that the visual arts exist by their very nature in a constant tension between orthodoxy and heresy. That's why the iconographic traditions had to come in to make sure that the picture would communicate the truth. Whether or not uh, we agree with each detail of her analysis. Chavel's research fascinates. What were the principal doctrinal issues, or if you will, theological statements, that exercised an influence on craftsmen and artists who produced sacred art during the Carolingian era, that is, the period from Charlemagne, 743 to 814, to Charles the Bald, 823, 877, roughly 50 years. This is sometimes known as the period of the Carolingian Renaissance. They included the relationship of the crucifixion or passion to both the Eucharist and the Church. The relationship of the crucifixion or passion to both the Eucharist and to the Church. The reality of Christ's human and divine natures, as I have already remarked, and the precise character of the Eucharistic conversion. These issues, especially those that pertain to the Eucharist, continued to occupy the attention of the Church throughout the 11th century. The Romanesque Church of Champagne in the Ardèche, which was built during the first half of the 12th century, helps us, albeit at a later period, to visualize Chavel's remark about theology and art. The portal of this small church, hidden in the valley of the Rhone, illustrates the influence that theological and doctrinal debates can exercise on sacred art. You, you have a copy in front of you. This is a, does any, if there's anyone who doesn't, we have some experts. This, huh? The church's main portal, 
which originally was protected by an outside porch, contains an elaborately sculpted bas-relief composed of two scenes. On top, the Calvary scene, depicting the moment when the soldier pierces Christ's side with a lance. If you look closely, you can see that that's what's, what's happening. On the bottom, Christ Eucharistizing at the Last Supper, and that's, I think, clear. What does the sculptor artist seek to portray? Simple. Catholic teaching on the intrinsic relationship of Calvary to the Eucharist. During another period in French history, this dual image also occasioned a demonstration of the limit between orthodoxy and heresy, not by the introduction of new iconographical traditions, but by the destruction of already existing ones. During the wars of religion in the 16th century, the portal, which you have before you, and you can see, became the object of what today we would call a hate crime. The reformers of that era struck out precisely at the iconic identification of the Seneca with Calvary. What did they protest? The sacrificial character of the Eucharist and the continuity of the priestly action that runs from Christ himself to the ordained priest. In short, the Eucharist as sacrifice. Figure or reality? Let's return to the Carolingian period. The question of how to relate symbolic sacramental figures to actual divine reality occupied theological reflection during the period when Europe began to take on its peculiar identity as a continent. Charlemagne's court at Aachen remains the recognized center of the liturgical and theological renewal that dominated this period of expansive Cesaro papism, or what Alcuin called the Regnum Christianitatis. It's beginning here in South America. <laughs> For example, Carolingian theologians such as Amalarius of Metz, Pascasius Rodbertus, Rotramnus, and Rabanus Maurus had sought to unravel the mystery of what it means to call the Blessed Eucharist real, not unravel the mystery, but explicate the mystery, talk about the mystery of the Blessed Eucharist as real. Opinions among thinkers veered between highly symbolic accounts to naive physicalisms, such as the one espoused by the Stercoranists, baldly illustrates. If you don't know who the Stercoranists were, you're just as lucky not to. Right? They had odd views. The debate that the aforementioned theologians began continued throughout the 11th century. In fact, the church portal in Champagne arguably sought to communicate visually the decision of Pope Gregory VII given at the Roman meeting in 1079, where Berengar of Tours, an 11th century figure confused about how to express reality in philosophical terms, signed his confession of faith in the real presence. I introduce these exhibits, the Sacramentary of Gelone and the Church Portal of Champagne, in order to point out that Mel Gibson is not the first artist whose theological intuitions have shaped his artistic representation of the Passion. What Chazelle has observed of Catholic art during the late 8th century up to the middle of the 9th century may also be said of Mel Gibson's art film, The Passion of the Christ, let me repeat her discovery. Works of art are not simple translations of theological statements, but take on rules of their own through the appropriation of iconographic traditions. Both the sacramentary and the portal confirm that at least certain iconographic traditions themselves derive from controversial theological exchanges within the Catholic communio two natures of Christ, 
relationship of the Eucharist to the church, of, the, of Calvary to the Eucharist and to the church, and how, and the nature of the Eucharistic conversion. The French film critic and Dominican priest, just in time, part two. <laughs> the French film critic and Dominican priest, Guy Bidwell, wrote his review of Gibson's film after having seen it here in Philadelphia. He describes the setting. La salle était comblée, à peu près entièrement composée de noirs venus en famille, bébé compris, et probablement pour la plupart issus des communautés pentecôtistes. If I had known John was going to remark on my French, I never would have put that in there. <laughs> now you see it's not so perfect. The auditorium was filled, mostly black families together with babes and arm, many of them from Pentecostalist churches. One mother was heard telling her daughter, see what the Lord had to suffer for us. Bedwell interprets Gibson's film in a way that Chazelle argues one must interpret the Carolingian art of the crucifixion. In other words, there are iconographic traditions at work. Mel Gibson's passion, so Bedwell argues, aims to capture the tradition that dominates Catholic spirituality and devotion from the high Middle Ages until the 19th century, including what occurs in the spectacular period that we call the Baroque. Thus the title of Bidwell's review, En Christ Baroque, that on at least one Saturday afternoon here in Philadelphia, the film merited a place in the catalog of Catholic pieties may be measured in part by the touching explanation that the black Pentecostalist mother was overheard giving to her daughter. When that black woman evangelized her child, a deeply held faith provided a definitive hermeneutical moment for the movie. What are some of the iconographical traditions that shape Gibson's art form? Surely one should begin with the Stations of the Cross, first set up by Franciscans in the later Middle Ages, to aid the faithful, appreciate the price of their salvation. Then there are the processions in Andalusia during Holy Week, which, as some surviving examples remind us, included public displays of self-flagellants. Also the medieval mystery plays, which continue on in the celebrated production at Oberammergau. And not to be overlooked are the Baroque paintings of the Catholic kind that one finds in Spain or in Latin America. The passion then suffers in the philosophical sense of the term, that is, is patient of many diverse theological influences. Do some of these stray from strictly orthodox piety? I think that it is safe to say that commentators will not give the same reply. On Bedwell's account, the art of the Baroque dominates Gibson's portrayal of the passion. It is said that some of the extra biblical details that appear in the film are borrowed from the writings of the German mystic Anna Katharina Emmerich. Her meditations on the Passion were popularized by Clemens Brettano, a figure of the late 18th and first half of the 19th century, and enjoyed significant influence on European Catholic culture during the 19th century. In fact, an English transla translation appeared as early as 1862, which is remarkable considering that there was no English Catholic Baroque. Gibson may also have read the visions of the Spanish mystic Maria de Agreda, a figure of the 17th century, which have still to win official approbation from the church. From these texts, which have their origin in the period of the Baroque and even Rococo, I would suggest emerge the iconographic traditions that Gibson employs to set forth his account of the Passion narrative. 
It would be futile, therefore, to debate the extent to which we find the gospel itself adequately represented in the Passion of the Christ. Like the Carolingian artist of the first millennium, Mel Gibson has chosen to let himself be influenced by a history of visual and literary interpretations that continues to occupy the Orthodox Catholic imagination. Part three. No reviewer, to my knowledge, has suggested that Mel Gibson read the Summa Theologiae before setting about to direct The Passion of the Christ. Aquinas represents a different sort of iconographic tradition. His structure is that of the architect who produces out of many theological arguments an ordered whole. This structure exhibits, as impressively as the Gothic cathedrals, which may have inspired the Sumists' art, God's own knowledge of himself. The Latin term that Aquinas gives to this knowledge, when it is shared with the blessed in heaven and on earth, is sacra doctrina, holy teaching, sacred doctrine. Let me invite you to focus your attention on what, in the Summa Theologiae, would be the equivalent of a single stained glass window in a medieval cathedral. Question 48 of the Tertia Pars, the work, the Summa, as you know, comprises three unequal parts designated by Aquinas' editors, first, second, and third. The third, or Tertia Pars, treats the mystery of the incarnation, the sacraments, and had Aquinas completed the Summa, also would have included the last things. Questions 48 and 49 occur toward the end of the treatment of the life of Christ and concern, in Aquinas' own words, de effectu passionis Christi, if you will, the result of Christ's passion. Question 49 considers the result itself, de ipso effectu, while question 48, which is one of the better studied essays in the Summa, examines how that effect was produced, de modo efficiendi, the mode of efficiency or the mode of causing efficiently. Let me know, efficiency is a technical philosophical term that points us back to Aristotle's four causes and urges us to inquire about what is responsible for something coming into being. The standard example is the artist, who is the efficient cause of the statue, which is composed of matter, material cause, marble, say, and the form that she puts into it, Apollo, for example, and which serves a purpose or final cause, which we identify as aesthetics or some other purpose that an artist may have for sculpting a statue. In Aquinas's usage, efficiently does not then connote, as it does in modern English, the restricted meaning of working productively with minimum wasted effort or expense. Modes of efficiency. The word modem may be compared roughly to the English word model, as in the title of the book authored by Avery Dulles, Models of the Church. I know that it has been a source of regret to Cardinal Dulles that many readers of this book thought that his models offered a range of options from which one could pick his or her favorite image or construct of the church. In fact, he intended that these models, when taken together, would provide a set of perspectives from which to attain a comprehensive description of the church. The five modes that Aquinas discusses in question 48 aim to provide the essential points of consideration from which to attain everything that the Gospels communicate about Christian salvation. To answer the question, how does the passion of Christ accomplish our salvation? Even the most frank critics of Mel Gibson allow that this is the question that he too sets out to answer. 
We will look briefly then at each of the five modes. The mode of merit. When Aquinas says that Christ, by his passion, merited salvation not only for himself, but for all who are his members as well, he introduces the question of the relationship of the cross to the church. This is 48, Article 1. Merit denotes the right to a reward. The reward of the passion is beatific communion, open to every member of the human race who remains potentially a member of the Church of Christ. According to the formula of St. Anselm, only God could merit such a grace, while only man should expend the energies to regain what he had lost. Christ has given grace not only for himself, but for his members. We call this grace the capital grace of Christ, inasmuch as he remains the caput ecclesiae, the head of the church. Some wonder why Christ's other merits would not have been sufficient to win for us the reward of eternal life. Aquinas replies that Christ did everything from the greatest charity, but the passion remains that kind of work, genus operis, or scholastic Latin, genus operis, best suited to the effects that we attribute to it. I'm going to read that again, it's very important. Many people, you know, complain, why did Mel Gibson choose the last hours of Christ's life and not give us, as many others have, the whole of his life? And Aquinas answers it. Huh? Christ did everything from the greatest charity. His whole life is filled with the greatest charity. But the passion remains that kind of work. Janus Ophorus, very technical term for Aquinas best suited to the effects that we attribute to it. And that's classic Thomas theology and methodology. He doesn't try to unravel the mystery, why did the Christ have to suffer? He simply accepts that the Christ did suffer, that it was God's will that he suffered, and therefore concludes that this act, as the, passion, as the Gospels themselves make clear, uh, is the one best suited to accomplish the effects that we attribute to it, which is the forgiveness of sins and the meriting of beatific fellowship for the whole human race. Mel Gibson surely constructed his film in such a way as to ensure that the viewer understands that this kind of work, this particular Janus Opus, is ordered to an effect that transcends whatever particular persons or events may be depicted in the drama. It is the passion of the Christ. Like Greek drama, Gibson has cast the film in such a way to allow its universal significance to emerge slowly from within the consciousness of the viewer. The mode of satisfaction. Aquinas takes up a theme that has figured in Catholic theology since at least the early 6th century, but which most students now identify with the work of the 11th century Archbishop Anselm of Canterbury, Cur Deus Homo. Aquinas reports the received teaching. Christ's passion was not only sufficient, but superabundant satisfaction, or atonement, if you will, for the sins of mankind. Christian satisfaction falls among the theological themes less well studied during the post-conciliar period. At the same time, the renewal of interest in the Eucharist as sacrifice should prompt theologians to return to this mode of Christ's passion inasmuch as it remains the lodestar for Catholic sacramental practice. Aquinas holds that Christ's sufferings, suffering was all-embracing and his pain so great on account of the dignity of his person that the satisfaction he offers, in addition to other reasons, suffices as recompense for the sins of the world. 
While merit earns a reward, satisfaction entails the acceptance of punishment. The two go together in Catholic piety, inescapable. Christ merits by his great love and charity, and he merits the reward, the perfection of the image of God in each of us. But we didn't start off from a neutral point, basically good people who just needed a little shove to get to heaven. We started off with the effects of original sin and the effects of the original sin appropriated in each one of us. And so there's, in addition to meriting beatific communion, vision, fellowship, heaven, there's the price to pay, which is at the heart, of course, of the passion, the suffering, the penal aspect of the passion is related to the uh, atonement necessary for what had been defected in us. A mystery which in God's mercy is taken up into Christ's own work in such a way that our small satisfactions, three Hail Marys, three Our Fathers, our small penances, no meat on five days out of the year, uh, taken up into uh, uh, a transformative work that goes on in each one of us because of our association with the person of Christ. No theme emerges with more clarity in Mel Gibson's film than the satisfaction of Christ. No one seems to have noticed that. Most commentators have failed to observe that there exists a theological reason, if you will, an iconographical tradition, for portraying, even as some have argued excessively, the sufferings of Christ from the time of his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane to his final consummatum est. If with Father Bidwell we allow that the scene of punishment in the film, scenes of punishment in the film, exceed the modesty of the scriptures themselves, or follow Professor Griset who opines that there's something unreal about this. After such beatings and penal treatment, no man would be able to shoulder the cross or even walk. One cannot exclude the explanation that the artist chose this excess for a theological reason. A long theological tradition supports this iconographical modification. The Church asks us to ponder the price that our Savior paid. Without this meditation, one cannot embrace the full dimensions of Catholic piety, as the celebrated caricature of liberal Protestantism reminds us, Christ without a cross leads man without sin into a world without suffering, and so forth. Bidwell is right, it seems to me, in pointing us to the practices of the Baroque period, which, after all, were the counterpoise to the rationalism that dominated the education, educated Europeans of the time. The mode of sacrifice. Sacrifice, writes Aquinas, designates what men offer to God in token of the special honor due him and in order to appease him. In this discussion, we're at Article 3 of Question 48, Aquinas allows St. Augustine to supply the instruction about sacrifice especially what the Doctor of Grace says in Book 10 of the City of God, chapters 5 and 6, and in his, that is, Augustine's De Trinitate. In short, sacrifice creates unity, from Augustine himself says. Sacrifice, why? In order that we might remain one with him. Christ's passion works according to the mode of sacrifice because it results ultimately in that union of God and man which we call beatific vision or fellowship. How diverse the lot of those involved in bringing about this unique sacrifice where Christ is both victim and priest. Aquinas replies to the objection that since those who slew Christ perpetrated a heinous crime, magnum militium, they could not have accomplished something sacred. On the part of those who put Christ to death, Aquinas replies, the passion was a crime, 
on the part of Christ who suffered out of love, it was a sacrifice. Mel Gibson portrays this theme with an exactitude that conforms not only to the biblical accounts of the Passion, but also to the theological affirmations that have been canonized by the Church with respect to the responsibility of those who had a hand in putting Christ to death. No one can watch the film and come away without an awareness that there are two kinds of persons surrounding the crucifixion scene. Those who believe that what is happening conforms to God's plan, even if they suffer great sorrow, though not sadness, and those without comprehension of the mystery. The latter class of persons includes, on the one hand, those with natural human sympathies, especially exhibited in the wife of Pilate, Claudia, and on the other, those who exhibit crass indifference, especially the lower ranks of Roman soldiers. The mode of redemption, Article 4. The theme of redemption or ransom arises uh, from the biblical text where Christ is said to redeem us. For example, 1 Peter 1.18 and following, you know that you were ransomed from the futile ways with the precious blood of the Lamb. In Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Christ liberates man from both the punishment of sin itself, the bondage or slavery that sin imposes, and from the penalty of the divine justice that opposes all sin because God, who is just, cannot act against his justice. Sin is self-punishing. You know, in a sense, God doesn't punish sinners. Sin is self-punishing. Punishing and punishing in this, to this extent that all sin is a derivation from the divine wisdom. And insofar as we freely embrace that derivation from the divine wisdom, we are set against God by the sin. And, and the punishment that follows is nothing more than God's eternity. He can't change to s decide, well, in, in the end, maybe there were extenuating circumstances, etc. Slavery and punishment, then, we are freed from both obligations, thus the mode of redemption. The Latin poet and hymn writer Prudentius expresses this ancient truth, Lo, now to the faithful is opened, the bright road to paradise leading. Man again is permitted to enter the garden he lost to the serpent. This effect, of course, is possible only because of the work of the whole Trinity. Christ as man, therefore, is properly speaking the immediate Redeemer, although the actual redemption can be attributed to the entire Trinity as to its first cause. Only God saves us. From start to finish, Mel Gibson does not shrink from including the devil in the dramatic action of the Passion of the Christ. You recall there were medieval theories, early patristic theories, where it was thought that the redemption of mankind was from the power of the devil, and in a sense it is, sin belongs to the devil. But the ransom is not paid to the devil, the ransom is paid to God because of the mode of sacrifice, but the result is to be liberated, the mode of redemption, from the thraldom of the devil. The devil, who would even try to divert Jesus from the mission received from his father, that's the Catechism 392, appears in androgynous guise, not in my view as a commentary on contemporary social mores, that was before I had a, a talk with John Haas, but, but to remind the viewers that the devil is a liar and the father of lies. What people believe to be the good turns out to constitute a lie about the good of the human person. It's the oldest story in the book. In this case, the book is Genesis. And should we not recognize in the fact that Mary Magdalene asks the question, 
Why is this night unlike any other night? Customarily reserved to the youngest son in a Jewish family of Mary, Christ's mother, not of the father, as a sign that the new Eve comprehends that the great reversal has been inaugurated, the mode of redemption. I remarked to, after the first viewing of the film to someone who said, how did you like it? I said, I knew I was gonna like it in the very first scene when uh, Christ crushes the head of the serpent with resolve. <laughs> the mode of efficient cause. The final article of Summa Theologiae Tertiopas, question 48, article six, since there are two articles devoted to the mode of redemption, completes the discussion of the passion by clarifying the special status of the one who is crucified. We have returned to the theological tradition that occupied the craftsmen who produced the miniature of the crucifixion in the sacramentary of Jalom. God is the principal efficient cause of man's salvation. But, says St. Thomas, since Christ's humanity is the instrument of his divinity, all Christ's acts and sufferings work instrumentally in virtue of his divinity in bringing about man's salvation. Representing Christ is impossible because it is impossible to represent visually what is invisible. Godhead remains invisible. Saints recognize this truth. Blessed John of Fiesole fra Angelico is said to have observed, to depict Christ, it is necessary to live with Christ. We should take him at his full eschatological word. Mel Gibson directs Jim Caviezel in a way that, yeah, I know it's a tough word to pronounce, in a way, uh, in my view, that approaches accomplishing the impossible. There are the Christs of Pasolini, of Zeffirelli, of Rossellini, but the Christ of Gibson best captures the impossible to portray in any plastic art what is invisible. Although I am not an art critic, it seems to me that the very excesses, even the distortions which commentators have questioned, in fact aim to show that this man is more than human. That we have to look elsewhere for the source of his human endurance. Is it too much a stretch to ask whether Gibson also indicates Christ's divinity by suggesting that he possesses infused knowledge. Admittedly, others may possess infused knowledge, but traditionally theologians have ascribed infused knowledge to Christ in his human knowing, precisely because of the hypostatic union. For instance, when Christ designs a 16th century European table for first century Palestinians, <laughs> or when without effort Christ speaks Latin with Pilate. Some experts have wondered about the absence of Greek in the film. They allege that the lingua franca outside of the orbit of, of the immediate orbit of the Roman Empire, the city of Rome, the Italian peninsula, was Greek and not Latin. In any event, has anyone conjectured that a first century Jew would have learned conversational Latin? I don't know, I don't think so, but in the film, Mel Gibson's Christ breaks into Latin conversation with Pilate with amazing f facility. We should not leave the mode of efficiency without observing that Gibson does not shy away from visualizing the signs of divine intervention that the Gospels record at the moment of Christ's death. The passion of the Christ does not end with musings over the presumed interior dispositions of Jesus' followers. 
The film ends with the unquestionable affirmation that this crucifixion results in events of cosmic significance that only God can produce. Let me conclude by observing that the theological issues of the Carolingian period continue to shape Catholic art forms. In Gibson's film, we see clearly faith and a new iconography emerge in the themes that represent perennial sources of reflection for Catholic theologians. The relationship of the crucifixion or passion to both the Eucharist and the Church, the reality of Christ's human and divine natures, and the precise character of the Eucharistic conversion. The relationship of Christ's passion to the Eucharist ranks among the signal achievements of the film. Who could deny that Mel Gibson professes the same Eucharistic faith as that of the anonymous sculptor of the low relief in Champagne. And what are we to think of the contemporary representatives of those 16th century reformers who hacked away at the joint representation of Calvary and Seneca? The relationship of Christ's passion to the church here again, Mal Gibson succeeds in a way that at once stresses the feminine character of the church. Only women touch the sacred blood, Veronica, Mary, Mary Magdalene, and by extension even Claudia, who supplies fresh linen for the purpose. And at the same time places the Virgin Mother of God, Mary Immaculate, in, the what is, in what is obviously the closest personal contact with the sufferings of her son. She, who is mother of the Redeemer, remains by that fact mother of all who are redeemed. We see Mary's maternal mediation enacted on film. It's remarkable. Gibson portrays Mary placing herself between her son and mankind. Remember the times that Mary looks at us. In the reality of their wants, needs, and sufferings. Remember Peter at her feet. She puts herself in the middle, that is to say she acts as a mediatrix, not as an outsider, but in her position as mother. The words are from John Paul II, mother of the Redeemer. Mel Gibson captures what the Pope writes in Mother of the Redeemer in a way that alone merits the film the title Catholic. We have already seen what Gibson does to ensure that his viewers recognize that the Christ possesses two real and distinct natures, that of God and that of man. Could it be that the Curious distinction between the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history that has so badly influenced even Catholic theological circles explains why so many criticisms of the film fail to comment on what should be the most obvious theological tradition to govern the production of this film. Do people look and think, well, that's the historical Jesus, I'll wait for the Christ to rise on Easter Sunday? In other words, do both those who rave about the film and those who criticize the film require the iconographical tradition that Mel Gibson employs to remind them that the truth of Christ's personal being is preserved only in the Church of Christ, that the crucified one is both God and man. Finally, the reality of the Eucharistic conversion. There is a sense in which the film is about the Eucharist, the bread of life. Saint Jerome bears witness to this truth. Why should I not mourn, you say? Jacob put on sackcloth for Joseph. But he only did so because Christ had not yet broken open the door of paradise nor quenched with his blood the flaming sword and the whirling of the guardian cherubim. But under Jesus, that is under the gospel of Christ, who unlocked for us the gate of paradise, 
death is accompanied not with sorrow, but with joy. The Passion of the Christ invites its viewers to recognize that in the bread, that now the joyful Jesus offers to his priest disciples in those remarkable flashbacks which are interspersed between the very act of sacrifice. There we discover the one source of the love and joy that never ends. Thank you.